Drake's here for round two, getting the butterfly garden planted. Hey Drake, I hope you don't mind that the garden looks a little bit different than the last time. Oh, I don't mind one bit. I actually like it a lot and, and keeping the uh, caging up helps keep the chickens and the horses out. The net's gonna help keep the chickens out of the garden so they don't destroy everything that we're putting together. I love that you stuck them up and not down. Yeah, I wanted to do the wood border out of the trees that we have on the farm. They were going to be taken down anyway. And then if we build it up high enough, it'll help contain the garden. So even if the chickens do end up scratching someday, it won't be spread all over the farm. Looks great. All of these logs around this garden are mesquite logs. They are trees that were scheduled to come down on the farm anyway. I figured this was a good time to go ahead and get those trees taken out and put them to good purpose. In order to prepare this, we just dug a little trench about three or four inches deep all the way around and then laid the logs in and packed the soil on the outside and the mulch on the inside. Ultimately, we won't want these white poles up all the way around the garden. Early on, in order to keep the chickens and the horse out, just to make sure the garden can get established, we're gonna have the white poles and the mesh fence probably for several months wrapped up around this garden. Now the question is, Drake, what's the next step? Um, the next step is going to be adding our uh, a soil amendment. Uh, so we have some um, bags here of Lady Brand uh, compost. Um, it's a mixture of many different things together, um, cow manure and um, other microorganisms um, that will help amend the, the soil and the uh, mulch and things that we have already put down. We, once we get that spread out, then we are going to put in Oyas. So before we actually put the soil amendment down, we're gonna go ahead and put the Oyas in the ground. Can you show me an Oya and describe what it does and how it works? It is a water catchment that is porous. This is a terracotta pot. And this has a little cap that has a reservoir. It holds water and then you can cap it so that no mosquitoes start breeding in there. So this holds water, but slowly leaks out into your garden bed. Strategically, you have a larger Oya and a smaller Oya, one for the big end of the garden and one for the small end. Correct. Down there, the smaller one, those plants will only grow to be about a six inch tall. So they won't need uh, as big of one because they're even more drought tolerant than the ones that would So your there. heavier feeders are going to be on this end around the bigger oil. Exactly. Just for perspective, I want to show you that this, this end of the garden is larger. It's like a half of a yin yang or yin yang or a paisley shape or a teardrop. So the smaller oil will be down on the pointy end, the larger oil on the bigger side. So we're going to have things that are kind of bigger here. And as it comes down this way, it gets a little bit shorter all the way down to these little ground covers here that will only get about six inches tall. Nice. All right, let's see how we're supposed to dig this Oya in the ground. We're gonna dig it down deep and we're gonna take it this, around this neck right here. And that's the only part that's actually gonna be sticking up from the ground. We got lots of good rain this past week, so that soil underneath should be really moist. That's that manure and compost, the uh, comp, uh, what's it called, cardboard layer. So when you're actually putting this in, make sure that your lid is already on it. You don't want to accidentally, as you're covering it, um, get dirt inside there, and then it's harder to rinse out because you, you won't be able to just pull this out of the ground um, once you have it in. Um, so always make sure that the cap is still on so the dirt accidentally gets inside. And looky here, some nice little helpers. Big fat night crawler. Down here on the small end of the garden, we have a much smaller Oya, so you won't have to dig as far. But exactly. this, this is just as a reminder to myself, this end is going to be the shorter plants ramping up down here on the bigger end. 
Correct. And this is gonna feed the shorter plants, which are only gonna grow about six inches high. They won't grow any taller than that, and they're a little bit of a ground cover. So um, shorter or smaller plants don't need quite as big of a, of a water reservoir to keep them watered. Now, just a minute ago, you were talking about the possibility of this garden becoming an official monarch butterfly or pollinator way station or yes. something? Yes, um, and basically what that is, is that you um, provide the host plants, nectar plants, a water source and shelter um, for the butterflies and particularly um, for the monarch, you need to have at least three different types of native milkweed. And so we have those today that we're gonna put in. And then also for the nectar, um, there's gonna be different levels and different heights. When you're having plants that you're putting in together, you're creating host and nectar in together. They interlock and they provide shelter for the caterpillars to kind of hide out from predators, um, but also have the um, resources to make their chrysalis. That's a good labor mulch in there. Yes, and the cardboard is nice and thick and nice and wet, which is getting all those microbes ready for the garden. So thankful for all that rain. There we go. And again, you just wanna make sure that when you're going to put your dirt back over it, make sure your lid is on top. Um, that way you're not accidentally getting any um, dirt material inside that will contaminate um, and block pores so that the water can't get out. So this here is um, Texas native violets. It is a native ground cover. Um, it's just starting to bloom for the second time. It blooms twice a year um, in the spring and again in fall. Um, it grows really great from rhizome and it also grows really great from reseeding itself. Um, this not only is just a native plant, but it's also a host plant for the uh, variegated fritillary. And that's a type of butterfly? Yes. All these big words, I'm not sure what they are. <laughs> and I know some people are familiar with, um, sometimes when they're planting plants, they'll kind of loosen the root bulb. Um, with some plants, you can do that and that's okay. When it comes to certain other plants, like for milkweed, um, for example, you won't ever want to loosen the root bulb from a milkweed plant. And that's because they are so susceptible to shock that you can actually break off a little bit of root and it will actually completely kill the plant altogether. So know the plants that it is okay to loosen the root bulb and know which ones that it's not. Just taking some compost and piling up around the sides of the plant. So the mulch was pulled back. The compost from the bag is added around the plant before the mulch is covered back up around the base of the plant. We're also going to be putting a thin layer of this black compost on top of all this mulch when we're done planting everything. And the rain and the water will push the nutrients from that compost down into the mulch layer. The next plant that we're putting in is Aristolochia fimbriata. And this is the host plant for the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. This plant is, it's a vine, but it's not a climbing vine. So it's a ground cover type of vine and it doesn't grow um, really crazy or choke out plants. So this is a very good ground cover and this is a great space for it because this particular plant has to grow in shade. So if you're a person that has lots of shade and not very many sunny areas and you still want to plant for butterflies, this is your perfect plant. So yeah, down on this end, the pointy end of this paisley shape, it's a little more sheltered all day long. Actually in the morning it gets dappled sun or dappled shade and uh, this tree right here provides a lot of shade in the evening from that harsh western sun. Look at that nice root bulb. Beautiful. And that one's going to benefit from being in very close proximity to the Oya. So lots of water. Keep in mind that this mulch layer is not perfect, pretty, fancy mulch that you would get in a bag. 
It's very composty. It's been breaking down outside for six months or longer. And we also added a good amount of horse manure and there's chicken manure mixed in. So there is some risk of nitrogen robbing from the mulch being in around the root mass, but there's also lots of composting action and fertilizers from the manure going on inside that mulch layer. The cardboard layer that you saw us put in in the first video, and you probably saw a glimpse of it as she was cutting through to plant these, that also is going to be helping to build the soil life as the cardboard decomposes and it's drawing up the worms and the fungus and all those things that help make healthy soil. And what is this one? However that said. Dementia. <laughs> um, and this is also a native uh, plant here in Texas. It will only get about as tall as this and maybe about another half a foot on each side, so another foot wider. Um, and this did have some nice pretty yellow flowers on it but our rain over the last few days kind of wiped them off um, but as soon as we get it into the ground i'm sure that it will rebloom again and this is a nectar source um, for the butterflies and it's also got two blooms one in spring and one in fall and all of these plants that you're planting here today came from your nursery yes i grow these um, i propagate these and um, so if you're actually needing any, just let me know. This plant here is Flamacanthus. This is a the, uh, Texas host plant for the Crimson Patch Butterfly and the Texan Crescent. So both of those uh, butterflies use it for their larval host plant, but it's also a great nectar source because not only is it good for butterflies, but as a host plant, but it's a nectar source for butterflies, bees, um, hummingbirds just absolutely love it. So it helps all of the nature, um, different types of bugs and stuff too. So this is a great um, plant to have. It will grow within one year, three feet high by four feet wide. It's a very fast grower. Um, so that's a good thing too, because it's gonna fill in this whole um, area that's right here. Over here we have blue plumblego, um, which is a great nectar source, um, but what many people don't know that this is also a host plant for the marine blue butterfly. But the marine blue butterfly is so little that it's literally just like an inch tall, fairly easily missed, um, and then they lay their eggs on the little blooms and the bloom buds. Um, so this is a host plant as well as a nectar, a nectar plant. Over here we have rock rose, um, and rock rose is in the mallow family. So this is also not just a nectar source, but it's also a host plant for um, different hair streak butterflies. Back here we have two of the fragrant mist flowers. So these are white blooms and mist flower, if I can say of any of the plants for nectar plants, is crack for butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds. So you have a lot of activity. Um, this is one of the plants that last year when I was here um, for farm day that I had these plants inside the actual butterfly cage before doing the butterfly release and they just can't get enough of it. It's for, for birds, hummingbirds love it, everybody is happy with it and loves it so it's a great nectar source to have in your garden. Right here in front of the Oya we have our milkweeds. We have three different types. We have green milkweed, swamp milkweed, and then we have butterfly weed. With different milkweeds that you have, you want to make sure that you know the scientific name for milkweeds because they'll sometimes in other nurseries will say something is butterfly weed, um, which is Asclepias tuberosa, um, which is this plant right here. But many nurseries no matter where you're at in the United States, we'll sell that as butterfly, as sell butterfly weed when it's actually tropical milkweed, which is Asclepias cursivosica. So you don't want the cursivosica to be planted in your native garden. It's a great, if you're rearing butterflies um, and you're rearing monarchs or queens, that's a great feeder plant. Um, but for here in Texas, I concentrate on things that are native and gonna help our wildlife and help restore and preserve and conserve our wildlife areas. This one here, Asclepias viridis, is the com is the uh, uh, scientific name, common name is green milkweed. And if you look at it right here, it looks like it's dead. But I promise you, <laughs> it is not dead. 
it is going dormant. We are the beginning of October, it's October 1st today. So this is exactly how this should look. This is gonna go dormant and then go through the winter and then come spring, it's gonna bloom and make, um, make a bigger, healthier plant. So whenever you're planting any type, it's the same with this here, this is swamp muckweed. This looks a little bit healthier, but this will also go dormant within the next few weeks. And especially when, even in spring, if you were to purchase a plant like this and you were to plant it, it's gonna look like it dies. And you're gonna think, oh shoot, it died, it didn't work. I promise you it didn't. All milkweeds grow its roots first. And if the plant is this high, the roots are usually two to three times as longer. So that's why it's hard to find these plants that are natives here because they can't stay in a, in a pot very long. They have to go in the ground within one year. Um, after the one year, if they're not put in the ground, they will actually die. So you'll always get very small, usually native plants um, for milkweed um, for that reason. I'm helping to plant and the first thing I notice when I put this one in the ground is that it looks like there's aphids on the bottom of the stem. It's a good thing that you know that you have these aphids here and a lot of people freak out over aphids, but you actually want to leave them there. It's gonna be part of your healthy ecosystem that you're creating and because when you're actually like just rinsing them off with a just a spray hose or you're using soapy water to kind of spray it down with and then rinse out the plant, um, you're not allowing the natural predators that would come in like ladybugs and hoverflies and lace wings that will come in and lay their eggs and then their larvae actually eat that. Um, so if they can't smell their dinner, then you're not gonna have a good, healthy, balanced ecosystem that's going on in here. Um, and then that's when your plants can actually get sick and die. A nice bonus tip to that is uh, just right when I shut the camera off, Drake was saying that you, you shouldn't ever rinse down milkweed or any type of host plant that's for butterflies with a soapy solution because that soapy solution could stay on the plant, or probably will stay on the plant, and can kill the caterpillar, caterpillars and butterflies that come to feed on that plant. Every one of those plants that she just described is now planted and put in the ground. I believe the next step is to put that compost as a layer on top of the mulch. Correct. We're just going to spread out the uh, thin sheet of the uh, compost and then we'll just water and we'll be all set. And are we just spreading this out by hand then after you dump it in? Yep. Well, you can do a rake or a little hand rake. You just want to be careful that you're not going to be raking and pulling out the plants that you had just put in. Is there any risk of putting this compost too high up the stems? Um, with your, your plants, yeah, you would, just around the plants, you want to have it um, just a little thin layer on the top. If you cover it too high, especially with your milkweeds, you're going to smother it and it can kill the plant. Now that we've pretty much installed the garden, it's my responsibility as the garden owner to keep it watered, keep the oyas filled up, and to keep the chickens and the horse out of the garden with my net that I'm going to put around here and next week we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the specifics of creating um, monarch way stations so yes this is a butterfly garden um, pollinator garden it's going to help all kinds of bees and butterflies and and even hummingbirds um, but we're going to talk specifics of what is needed and how to create your monarch way station which you already have here now um, and then we're also going to talk about cover crops. Oh yeah, cover crops. Very good. And until next time, peace, peace love, love and butterflies. butterflies.